In this module, we are going to be looking at non-homeostatic appetite, which I often just will call hedonic appetite, although non-homeostatic is a bit of a better uh, umbrella term. So, so far we have learned about homeostatic regulation of feeding. So this is the type of regulation that where we're sensing internal signals, we're figuring out what's going on in adipose tissue via messages via leptin, we're figuring out what's going on in the digestive tract via messages like GLP-1 and ghrelin and uh, cholecystokinin and the microbiota is also communicating with the um, appetite regulation center in the hypothalamus and that's all meant to like keep things in check and it's all meant to like promote energy balance, okay? However, as we know, non-homeostatic factors can override that, which is something we kept talking about in the last module, where other things that go beyond just keeping everything in balance, everything in check, can override those, those internal signals to promote um, food intake. Okay. So individuals with obesity are more likely to have dysregulated homeostatic function okay, due to uh, genetic changes, due to changes in secretion patterns or uh, resistance to particular, um, to particular peptides. And also some individuals with obesity also have kind of an upregulation of this non-homeostatic feeding, which is it's not like happening in one brain region because the brain doesn't work that way. The brain is highly integrated and everything kind of works together on everything, but there's a lot of communication between different parts. But there's three main areas of the brain that we're going to focus on with respect to this non-homeostatic control of feeding, although there's probably more than what we know so far. So we'll start with like our prefrontal cortex and its ability to kind of sense what we see in our environment and what we smell, what we th uh, think of food and kind of integrates that with our thinking processes, our judgment processes, our evaluation processes and decides on whether to eat or not. Uh, cognition is highly integrated with memory too, but our memory centers, particularly located in the hippocampus, can also have an effect on food intake by like reminding us of what we really enjoy eating or reminding us of like, you know, certain times of the day and it's time to eat right now or, you know, how much food is an appropriate amount of, of food to eat given kind of past experiences. And then most of our focus today is going to be on this concept of reward circuitry, which is, a, which is an area that's highly uh, investigated with respect to uh, drug misuse, um, but also might be compromised in individuals with obesity. So reward is all about like, basically integrating behaviors, making sure those behaviors keep happening because we get like a bit of a high almost from certain um, certain behaviors or certain drugs, which, you know, some people argue food can have that same kind of drug or addiction type um, properties, okay? But that's, that's debated a bit, okay? So I like this slide, although it focuses a little bit more on just, we just kind of over, talk about hedonic eating overall. I like this slide because it kind of contrasts what's going on in a leaner state compared to a state uh, where individuals um, have obesity. Okay, so in individuals without obesity, hedonic behavior still exists, homeostatic behavior still exists as well, but they're more or less in balance to keep food intake in check. And really it's homeostatic input or homeostatic control, I should say, that's driving the ship more than anything else. And that's responding to hunger and satiety signals that are feeding back to the hypothalamus via various endocrine and vagal pathways, okay? Reward is still a part of food intake, you know, even people without obesity find uh, foods rewarding, but this isn't like overriding everything. Whereas individuals with obesity, that reward system, that hedonic eating and just overall non-homeostatic appetite is really taking over, plus homeostatic control is compromised. So as I keep saying, it's kind of no wonder certain individuals have a hard time controlling what they eat because the homeostatic regulation is compromised, plus this reward system is kind of on overdrive. And we'll look at some of the, the evidence to support that. 
Okay, so important caveats before we go any further. I'm going to kind of generalize things and say, okay, the hippocampus does this, and the prefrontal cortex does this, and the um, and the nucleus accumbens does this, but it's not, the brain doesn't work that way. It's not reductionist in nature. Things are highly integrated. There's lots of communication between areas of the brain, though we do see certain things more localized, certain processes, certain behaviors. We see activations in certain brain regions more so um, than others with, with certain behaviors and certain experiences, okay? Um, it's also important to note that homeostatic and non-homeostatic processes aren't exclusive, okay? There's overlap between these processes. So for instance, ghrelin and other circulating factors can modulate our, our um, non-homeostatic uh, feeding system to, well, in the case of ghrelin, maybe make food intake even more, even higher, um, not just due to homeostatic reasons, but also due to hedonic reasons, maybe making that food even more uh, attractive, okay? And like I keep saying, in individuals with obesity, homeostatic appetite is shifted towards potentially a higher set point or a higher kind of um, feeding pattern, plus hedonic can override that as well. Okay, hedonic, non-homeostatic. Okay, I'll, I'll use hedonic and non-homeostatic interchangeably, though like non-homeostatic is a better umbrella term. Okay, so I want to start by talking about the prefrontal cortex and its role in appetite regulation. So I think prefrontal cortex, this area more or less right here, okay, in our frontal lobe, which is often called the area of executive function. This is where uh, kind of our judgments come from, our ability to reason through things is often primarily located in this region. We see activation in this region when, when people are kind of doing complex computational tasks and also when they're judging like what's the best approach. It's a lot about like deciding where to go. Okay, that's part of the, the cortical regulation or um, specifically in the free print prefrontal cortex, okay? And the prefrontal cortex, what it is is doing too is it's like deciding what to do based on all the various inputs, the sensory inputs and other inputs from other brain regions as well. So for instance, we're getting uh, information about the sight, smell of food, um, and we are taking that in through some of our sensory pathways, and then you know information is sent to the prefrontal cortex about that, and it's going to integrate that information with other information from the brain too, to decide, should I do this, should I not, should I go for food, should I not, okay? And hunger can modulate um, our perceptions of what we should and shouldn't do with respect to food, okay? So what's interesting about um, feeding and the prefrontal cortex is that they can actually localize um, certain eating patterns to certain specific regions of the prefrontal cortex. Okay, so for instance, the dorsal medial, so this is a sagittal view, so we've cut the brain kind of this way and we're looking at it like that. <laughs> so if I'm looking at this uh, mid-sagittal view, I can see my dorsal medial uh, prefrontal cortex compared to more on the superficial region where you would find our dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex has been shown to be more associated with the upregulation of food intake, higher feeding, whereas the dorsal lateral does the converse. It's more associated with the downregulation of feeding behavior, okay? Interestingly, and how this relates to obesity, is individuals with binge eating disorders, disorder and other forms of obesity, okay? Binge eating disorder can predispose to obesity, not necessarily cause it, but it can predispose to it. But individuals with binge eating disorder who have a harder time kind of controlling their food intake uh, tend to have lower activity overall in the prefrontal cortex and particularly uh, newer studies have shown that um, especially neuroimaging studies have shown lower activation specifically in the dorsal lateral okay and remember the dorsal lateral that's eat less it's a bit of the eat less um, system <laughs> okay so uh, again it's important to realize that there are certain brain changes or differences in brain activity 
in individuals with obesity that can also predispose to upregulation of food intake. The prefrontal cortex is also, if we were to say there's a willpower center, that's really that prefrontal cortex as well. And I think it's important here to, to make a note that just how <laughs> useless it is to really try to get people to not be obese or to eat less by telling them to have more willpower. Because some of their control over willpower is compromised in individuals with obesity. Plus, we don't talk that much about willpower in this class, but willpower can be exhausted. It's not the same for everyone. People tend to have less willpower at the end of the day. And the more you use willpower, the less you have left over. Okay, the more you get like exhausted by it and you kind of <laughs> sometimes overconsume accordingly. Okay, so I don't really re recommend recommending willpower, and it's really not the issue with individuals with obesity. It's all these other signals that are kind of like overriding our desire to not eat. Okay, another area that's really important in the regulation of food intake that's not specifically homeostatic or not only homeostatic is the hippocampus. I love the word hippocampus because it means seahorse. So if you think of like a seahorse, like the hippocampus looks kind of like a bit of a seahorse, or at least like the sea part of the seahorse. <laughs> I know sea is different here, but um, if you were to Google hippocampus, you will hear, probably see the words, it has a well-established role in learning and memory. Okay, that's one of the main functions of the hippocampus, but again, of course, no brain region works fully on its own. Okay, so what does the hippocampus do with respect to, to feeding? It integrates environmental cues with information about current energy status and with previous learned experience with respect to eating, okay? So like, for instance, oh hey, it's 6 p.m., usually you eat around this time. Oh hey, this plate has this much on it, usually I remember that I typically eat this much in a food, okay? So it can kind of modulate food intake behavior through information kind of in those areas and beyond, okay? so. I like the sentence here, can affect hunger, or I should say appetite better, based on the amount of, of food perceived to have been consumed. So when we eat more distractedly, we have a harder time comparing what we're consuming with what our hippocampus and other areas of the brain know to be a, an acceptable, right, a normal amount of food consumption. Okay, so if we want to make sure that we're eating in line with our memories of what's an appropriate amount, we have to pay attention to what we eat because distracted eating can, can negatively affect that. So that's a potential um, intervention point. Okay, so I've already talked a little bit about this, potential ways the hippocampus regulates food intake, memory-based decisions on when, how much to eat, you know, um, it, it could possibly even like the, promote some of the triggers like when I see this restaurant, you know, I remember enjoying eating at that restaurant and I want to eat there, right? I see McDonald's Golden Arches <laughs> and I remember my positive experiences with McDonald's and I want to eat there, okay? So the craving and imagery of food can also show more activation in the in the hippocampus like i've taught hippocampus uh, i've also talked about the perception of time and nutrient related learning as far as like you know what kind of nutrients invoked which responses in our body and how we remember that and that has implications for the next time we eat and our memories of certain foods and what their their overall um effect on us were okay so, like I've already said, one of the things to note about the hippocampus is that distracted eating can distort perceptions of how much we eat. And if our hippocampus is measuring how much we're eating right now to our memories of how much is an appropriate amount to eat, if we're not providing uh, proper input through our sensory pathways and the integration of our prefrontal cortex as well, what we are currently eating can't be measured against you know, what we have learned to be an appropriate amount of food, whatever that means, okay? And something really interesting that newer studies have, have taken a big focus on is that a Western-style diet, so a diet higher in sugar and saturated fat, more processed foods, has been shown to uh, rapidly 
like within within hours and within days rapidly impair hippocampal associated appetite regulation this has been shown both in humans and in mice okay so um and this makes sense to me because the western style diet this one that's full of highly processed food it's just kind of a nutrient organization in food that our body doesn't recognize as like what food is like. <laughs> it's like Franken food. It's not in the correct kind of nutrient organization and nutrient content that our body recognizes as, you know, food, which might provoke uh, changes in the hippocampus as far as our ability to perceive what we are eating and to make sure that we're eating an appropriate amount. Okay, so another intervention point here is to make sure that people uh, we're maybe working with or ourselves focus on uh, a diet higher in whole foods because that can help nutrient sensing, not just in the brain, but also in the digestive tract as well. Um, when I teach first year nutrition, that's like one of the first rules of nutrition. Like there's so many arguments in nutrition, but there's one thing that like pretty much everyone agrees with. Uh, plants are good, that's one thing. And another thing is that a diet based on whole foods is the way to go. And we should try to minimize processed foods for a number of reasons, and this gives another one of those. So I love this quote, and I wanted to end the kind of this first uh, part of this module on this quote. Um, Ponder well on this point. The pleasant hours of our lives are all connected by a more or less tangible link with some memory of the table. I just got chills as I said that, right? And I love this quote because it really like kind of gives more of a, um, a heart-based view of the hippocamp hippocampus as well. I keep calling it the hippocampus, hippocampus, because it's like we have all these memories of eating. Eating is like associated with like love. Think of like, you know, the traditional <laughs> Italian grandma, <laughs> I'm stereotyping here, but it's like manja, manja, eat, eat, eat. You know, they're showing love through food. We remember celebrating at the table, celebrating with our friends and all these things. That's locked into our memory. And of course, it's going to make us crave food, you know, when it's associated with these positive memories, okay? And, you know, if we're trying to perhaps cope with less happy memories or less happy feelings, we might go to something that provokes more happier feelings and happier memories. So um, I love this quote because it really, you know, like I said, it gives the more of that heart-based view of uh, memory and food. Okay, so that I just wanted to introduce this concept of non-homeostatic feeding and talk specifically about the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, but I want to leave kind of an entire module on its own to talk about reward and the mesolimbic pathway. So we'll be back in the next unit to do that.